My name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. We're going to be speaking about point of care ultrasound here. And uh, with this talk specifically, we're going to discuss vascular access. And using ultrasound to guide vascular access has become fairly commonplace but it's still worth thinking about using point of care sonography to assist any procedure. Um, I like to think about it a, a bit of the way that uh, an interventional radiologist might. And um, we typically use standard approaches or sometimes people refer to them as landmark uh, approaches based on surface anatomy. And uh, a lot of the patients in critical care environments in the ICU, on a medical ward, or in um, the emergency department are very difficult uh, either for venous access or other landmark-based approaches. And that's because uh, people may be obese or have prior surgeries. They may have difficult landmarks. They may have poor functional reserve, congestive heart failure, for example. So they can't tolerate sitting or laying in a position where you would normally like to do your procedure. It may be an emergent situation like respiratory distress or during a code situation where you're going to have one shot at it, so you want to put all of your best resources into getting this procedure done properly and getting it done right and quickly. So uh, other patients have abnormal anatomy, or if you work in some environments where you're not the only provider taking care of a patient, you may not be the first person to attempt this procedure on them. So they may have had prior failed attempts, and then you are inserting a needle through this minefield of prior um, uh, failed attempts at a central line or abscess aspiration or some other procedure. So it's worth giving yourself, again, every benefit every opportunity before approaching the patient. So emergency department patients and other environments can often be pretty poor candidates for standard procedures. And uh, certainly once you get the hang of beginning to use ultrasound to guide your procedures, uh, you come to rely on it, not because you've lost your physical examination skills or you've lost the ability to deal with landmarks, but you realize how fraught with difficulty some of these older techniques were. So here, for example, is a wonderful diagram from a great review article by McGee and Gould, New England Journal, 2003, um, demonstrating a very classic approach towards cannulating the internal jugular vein. And if you look at the uh, triangle made by the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the sternal head here and the clavicular head there, well, if you place your needle at the apex of that triangle, you should uh, hit the internal jugular vein. You should hit the internal jugular vein if your patient has a vein in that location, if they have surface anatomy that allows you to visualize that landmark, if they're cooperative enough that they can flex that muscle and allow you to see the two discrete heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Uh, unfortunately for a lot of providers, our experience is that patients who need a line uh, don't have any of those things. And you may find, for example, when you actually put the ultrasound probe on the patient, some patients have the vein laying right on top of the artery. Some people have it sort of in a diagonal orientation. Some people have it next to each other. So the anatomy is, is very variable patient to patient. So using ultrasound to guide your procedure as you're doing it in real time allows you the benefit of all your experience that you would normally use anyway. But instead of taking all your experience with the last 50 or 100 patients that you've used and taking all that aggregate wisdom and applying it specifically to that one patient, you can take everything you've learned about all those prior patients and tailor it to the specific anatomy of that individual patient. So instead of doing the same thing every time, because that in aggregate is what you learned is the most commonly successful approach, you can take what's going to work for one particular patient. So if you learned that uh, pillows or a neck roll behind the neck uh, dilates the IJ well, um, you can do that or not in your particular patient because you can visualize with ultrasound and see whether that improves your view. You can see whether turning the patient's head away from the procedure or having them face straight on is better because you can see on that particular patient how that changes their anatomy. So it's a huge advantage over just taking what's worked for patients in the past and assuming it's going to work for your next patient. So central venous lines um, have a reasonable complication rate, and this is well known and documented even in the hands of uh, seasoned clinicians. And again, McGee and Gould describe um, in aggregate, not a formal meta-analysis, but they describe uh, failure rates and complication rates that are described prior to 2003 in the literature. So arterial puncture rates, hematoma, pneumothorax, uh, uh, and hemothorax, for example. So we'll see, for example, that the femoral vein cannulation has among the highest rates of complication, especially arterial puncture and hematoma. And yet this is the line uh, that so most likely to cause uh, arterial complication, and yet it's the line that most people would commonly go to in a setting of a patient 
patient who's coagulopathic, for example. So the reason for that somewhat dissonant logic is that you can compress it at least. So you have a higher chance of having a complication, but also a higher chance of managing that complication. While the subclavian cannulation is the lowest rate of arterial puncture, uh, it may not be tolerable to have you know, a 3 or even a 2 or a 1% chance of uh, arterial cannulation when you can't really do anything to compress it at that location. So we see that we play this game of trading off complications uh, for being able to manage them. And again, these are, since the article is relatively older, and this is studying literature that's some of which was uh, even old when the study came out, uh, a lot of this was not guided with ultrasound guidance. So since then, there have been uh, many, many studies uh, demonstrating the benefits of using ultrasound guidance for central vein cannulation. So there was a uh, review in uh, clinical care medicine back in 1996, which was a, a meta-analysis. And again, I'm demonstrating an older study here to show that even in 1996, there was enough evidence to suggest that venous cannulation with ultrasound was worthwhile, and there were enough studies to do a meta-analysis even then. This demonstrated that uh, using a number needed to treat model that you would need to use ultrasound in seven patients to prevent one complication. So there's a lot of other things we do in medicine uh, that have a, a much higher number uh, needed to treat than this. McGee and Gould, again, if you want to quote a New England Journal article to someone who's wondering why you're using venous cannulation uh, with ultrasound, uh, recommends using ultrasound guidance. And uh, one of the more powerful uh, studies that came out was this report um, from the AHRQ. So back in 2001, this report on patient safety practices. Now, this is the same article which contained a large number of patient safety practices, such as calling a timeout before a procedure to confirm the proper patient, the proper procedure, the proper side of the body. Um, discusses uh, look-alike, sound-alike medications and other things that we use on a daily basis to make our patient care safer. And ultrasound uh, was right up there. I believe it was number seven in terms of the evidence base and the efficacy of using ultrasound to guide central venous cannulation. So certainly something that's recommended by AHRQ as well. And uh, probably most recently, in terms of government guidelines, the Centers for Disease Control, in their guidelines on preventing intravascular catheter-related infections in 2011, recommend using ultrasound guidance uh, to uh, aid cannulation of vessels. So there are several ways we can do this. If you are fortunate enough to have a patient whose anatomy looks like this that you need to cannulate them, you can have a look at their sternocleidomastoid muscle, determine where you think their IJ is, and you can use a landmark approach. That's commonly referred to as a landmark approach, despite the fact that many of my ultrasound colleagues refer to this now as a blind approach. I don't think the inventor of central venous cannulation using landmarks uh, referred to it as a, a blind technique, and there's still some validity in using anatomic landmarks in doing procedures. The next possibility is you use ultrasound and you get an image of the IJ and you mark an X on the spot on the skin where you need to do your procedure. You put the ultrasound away and you begin to do the procedure knowing where the vein is, X marks the spot. This is typically referred to as a static approach towards procedure guidance. And um, while it's not generally recommended for intravenous catheter placement for reasons that we'll get into through the rest of this talk, uh, it's commonly employed for other things like abs abscess aspiration, thoracentesis, um, uh, paracentesis, and other uh, procedures where you have a much larger target area. So uh, there was a study um, by Milling and Melnicker and several other authors that came out in critical care medicine in 2005 that looked at these different approaches, looked at a dynamic approach, which is guiding uh, in real time the needle into the vessel using ultrasound guidance throughout the entire procedure under sterile technique, static guidance where you mark the spot where the vein is using ultrasound and then move on to the procedure without real-time ultrasound guidance versus a landmark technique. So these patients were all uh, randomized to um, ultrasound or landmark technique, and then there was a crossover model where failed attempts using the first technique could move into a different technique instead. So success rates with dynamic guidance were 98%, uh, over 82% with static, over 64% with landmark. So we see the odds ratios um, for success as well as first pass success greatly favored um, any ultrasound guidance, but certainly dynamic guidance over static guidance. So how do we actually do this? Well, let's separate our, our hands a little bit and think about what the probe hand is going to do, and then we'll talk about what the needle hand is going to do. So 
it's important to speak about holding the probe. And uh, with any ultrasound, it's worth holding the probe in such a way that you're going to be as stable as possible. So you want to hold the probe in uh, usually the first three fingers of your hand, and you'll hold it sort of like a pencil or like I'm holding this phone. So I'm holding the probe, I can be very stable, but I've got a couple of fingers left over and I have the heel of my hand so I can maintain a stable base where I want to put the probe. So I plant my base on the patient, I have my other fingers to stabilize the probe holding, I'm not going to slip and move around, and then I can gently lower the probe down onto the patient. This gives me a couple of different advantages. I'm not going to slide on this slippery gel filled surface because I've got a good probe uh, stability here. And also I can control with a lot of little fine motor control now using the small muscles in my hand exactly where I'm going to place the probe. So I can control how much pressure I'm going to put in a very fine fashion. So, um, hold the probe hand, which is typically going to be your non-dominant hand, so that you're stable like this. You also want to keep most of your fingers behind the probe so that you're not getting in the way of the needle that's going to be uh, getting very close to the base of this probe. So what does your syringe hand do? So worth, again, talking about a little syringe etiquette. A lot of people like to hold a syringe like they're holding a pencil, and that's great, and it can give you some stability. The problem is a, a syringe has a plunger and then the remaining part of the syringe. So when you're not holding the syringe, uh, when you're holding the syringe like a pencil, you lose the ability to dynamically manipulate the plunger as well. So what I would recommend is holding the probe, uh, I'm sorry, holding the probe in your non-dominant hand, holding the syringe such that you can pull on the plunger. So hold the probe in your dominant hand, uh, I'm sorry, hold the probe in your non-dominant hand, the syringe is going to be in your dominant hand, and hold it so that uh, your fingers are curled around the plunger and you can control and put a little bit of negative pressure on the syringe when you need to. So if you find that you need to hold the syringe with two hands to make it work, I'd like you to think about someone who's uh, playing violin. If you ever watch a person play violin, they have it up in the crook of their neck here, and they hold the bow in one hand, and they have the, uh, they're holding the, the, the fingerboard in their, in their non-dominant, or in their left hand. So um, when they let go, the violin doesn't fall. It stays in that same position, because they're not using this left hand to hold the violin. It's just using to play the notes. So if you can hold a syringe with one hand, that leaves your left hand free to do a lot of different things. Your left hand can stabilize the syringe on a patient who's moving a bit. It can um, stabilize it um, at the angle uh, that you're inserting the needle. And uh, it can also hold the hub while you unscrew the uh, syringe and allow you to place a guide wire or do the next steps in the procedure. So, or it can also hold a probe. So if you're using two hands to hold the syringe, you don't have that extra hand. Uh, as soon as you get the hang of using one hand to hold the syringe, it leaves you a lot of options open to uh, be able to use your non-dominant hand for a lot of other things that are going to be helpful. So here's one way that you can use one hand to pull back on the plunger and then also inject if needed. So again, this technique is worth taking the little digression out of this ultrasound talk to, to play with this. Uh, my hand position is my hand position. You may try to use a similar hand position or find something that works for you, but the idea is if you can create negative pressure and positive pressure while holding a syringe relatively stably with only one hand, it again, leaves you a lot of options. And this can be helpful for venous access. It could also be helpful for... Um, for infiltrating um, you know, lidocaine or, or local anesthetics into the skin um, and other uh, procedures where you basically have a needle inside of a patient's body. So the huge benefit of um, having a probe in your left hand and a needle in your right hand while being able to hold some negative pressure on that plunger, just a little bit, just half a cc or so, um, is you're going to have three separate mechanisms to inform you that you've cannulated the vein. Because as soon as you cannulate the vein, three things should happen. You should be able to feel a pressure difference inside that syringe. Um, you're typically holding some negative pressure. It's going to feel like a little suction. It's going to be pulling back on you. And once you enter the vessel and you get a flash, that pressure will disappear. So you'll feel that you're in. You should see a flash in the syringe. And you don't always see a flash in the syringe uh, when you're holding it like a pencil because there's a little bit too much pressure inside the syringe for the blood to overcome it. And finally, you're going to see the needle entering the vessel on ultrasound because you're going to be holding the probe in your left hand. You're looking down at the patient. You're looking up at the screen, back and forth. So again, three different things. The reality is you won't always get all three things. But if you set three alarms for yourself, 
one or two of them are going to go off at least to wake you up in the morning. So it's helpful to have three separate ways to notify you the second that you've entered the vein so you can begin to change your technique and go into the I've entered the vein part of the procedure um, from the I'm finding the vein part of the procedure. So how should your positioning be? We know what your left hand is doing. We know what your right hand is doing. I'm sorry to all you lefties. Obviously, this is a very right hand centric talk. Um, we need to set up the patient really is the most important thing. The patient should be set up exactly like you would normally do the procedure. So fully draped and prepped, you want to be able to visualize your field of view very nicely. So we have our sterile gown and gloved um, uh, operator here standing at the head of the bed, ready to put a left internal jugular central line in place. Probe is in his non-dominant left hand, syringe, uh, syringe and needler in his right hand, his dominant hand. So the ultrasound machine itself should be set up in a location that allows you very easy access to be able to view it. You should be able to look at the ultrasound machine screen and the patient with very little movement of your head or eyes. So it's just like when you sit in the car and you want to be able to see the rear view mirror so that you, when you're driving, you're looking at the road and you're looking at the rear view mirror. And when you first started driving, that was a little awkward. And it was very difficult, and you had to be reminded to look at one versus the other. And it's going to be the same way when you first start with ultrasound. You're going to look down at the patient and forget the screen, or you're going to get focused on the screen and forget the patient. Both of those are problems, and they're no different than staring at the rearview mirror while you're going down the highway at 90 miles an hour. Just any reasonable person wouldn't do that. So it's not a fault of ultrasound that you wouldn't stare at the ultrasound machine instead of the patient. You need to look at both with a little bit of practice, it becomes truly second nature. But it doesn't become second nature unless they're set up right in front of each other. So you look down at the patient, you look up at the screen. Sometimes that means the machine needs to be on the opposite side of the patient. Sometimes it means it needs to be right next to you. But if you're trying to do a procedure and some helpful person places the machine behind you somewhere, if you're looking back and forth over your shoulder, you're not doing yourself or your patient any favors, and you're not going to make that procedure any easier for yourself. So machine set up, the patient set up. You hold the probe in your left hand. Hold the probe marker so that the probe marker is facing towards your left. If you're familiar with using ultrasound for diagnostic purposes, looking at hearts and gallbladders and aortas and IVCs, normally we talk about the probe with respect to the patient. But the patient's not the one with the needle in their hand. You're the one with the needle in your hand. So you need to hold the probe so that the heads-up display that this ultrasound machine has just become is going to correspond to your position and not the patient's position. So your left hand, probe facing towards your left, that means the left side of the screen is your left. And the way this becomes really relevant is when you have a needle in the patient's neck and it, you see it's going too far to the right on the screen, it's going too far to your right. So you pull back and you redirect towards the center. And it's all with respect to your anatomy. So you don't have to think, again, when you've got this sharp object near major arteries in someone's neck, is the left my left? Is it the patient's left? Do I go right to move left? There's none of that. Left is left. It's your left. And it should be very straightforward and it doesn't require any recalibration of your proprioception to get the hang of it. So here's another example where it's probably a little more awkward in, in the positioning here, but this provider actually felt it pretty comfortable to keep his neck turned a little bit to the left and, and see the screen. But you definitely want to be able to see the screen and the probe and the patient all at the same time. So you can be fully sterile, uh, and you should be fully sterile to do your central lines, and, and ultrasound shouldn't change any of that. It doesn't take very long to uh, gown and, and glove. It doesn't take very long to prep and drape your patient, and it certainly doesn't take very long to stick a sterile probe cover on the end of the ultrasound machine. So in the uh, background of this image, on the left-hand side, you see a sterile operator. They are gowned and gloved, and the patient's all prepped. In the near field, we have a dirty hand holding a dirty probe with dirty gel on it, and that's fine. The uh, operator then opens up a sterile sheath. And if you don't have these in your department, uh, you can usually get them from central supply in your hospital. You can have them tubed up from the OR or from some other area where they are using um, ultrasound probes already. And when you're just getting started and you're not borrowing a bunch of these, you're like that guy at the party that bums a cigarette every now and then. It's not terribly annoying. Um, eventually, you're going to get to the point where you're using these a lot, and then you just want to have your own supply. And that's the point when you realize that you're a smoker, except it's in a good way because you're using ultrasound to guide your central lines. So... You place a little bit of the sterile gel that comes in the packet um, on the end of the ultrasound probe, and now you've got gel inside the probe, which is important to make a good interface, squish out the air bubbles. You've got gel on the outside of the probe to make a good interface between the sheath and the patient's skin.
Um, brief word on the ultrasound probes. They're, they're not a massive luxury. They're, they're pretty readily available, and it's definitely worth having them around, especially if this is going to be the one thing that turns your sterile setup into a non-sterile setup, because there's really no such thing as kind of sterile. So if you're using a sterile glove, uh, that gives you two inches of sterility on your field, which isn't enough. It's a non-sterile line. If you're using the big tegaderm, which is another trick people like to use, you've got an inch and a half of sterility. Again, a non-sterile line. So if this means that you place a line with ultrasound guidance and it's a good line, you use all your experience and your good technique, and then as soon as the patient gets into the unit or transferred to a different area, they're going to have their line replaced unnecessarily because you didn't have a sterile probe cover, it's really worth thinking about this kind of stuff before you place the line. So. Two major approaches, each of which has drawbacks and uh, positives. There's an in-plane approach where the needle is placed in the same plane as the ultrasound beam. And then there's an out-of-plane approach that you see on the right-hand side where the ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the path of the needle. So the in-plane approach is a very nice, finessed approach. You can see the entire needle. You can watch it as it slides uh, into the vein. You can see the angle. You can see how far it's gotten in. You can see if you've gone past the vein. And a lot of authors describe that this is the best way to do it. The difficulty with this is it requires a bit of um, uh, finesse and proprioception to be able to maintain the uh, vessel beneath your plane and the needle aligned with both of them simultaneously because you're essentially aligning a plane, a tube, and the line. So it's a little bit difficult. It takes a lot of practice to be able to do that properly. And staying in that plane can be difficult, and you don't see the much anatomy. So if you veer off the plane, it's very difficult to tell where your needle is. Have I gone towards a nerve? Have I gone towards the artery? Am I too deep? Am I too shallow? If your needle isn't in that plane, you don't know where you are. That's a drawback of this technique. The out-of-plane approach offers a couple of benefits. You can see anatomy um, on both sides. We'll see in a moment that you can see, for example, for the IJ, you see the IJ, you see the carotid, and you see the anatomy sort of laid out for you. And you can adjust. If you're too far to the left, you pull back. If you're too far to the right, you pull back. So a lot of people find that pretty helpful. The downside is you're trying to see just the tip of the needle. You want to follow the tip. And as soon as the tip of your needle passes the ultrasound beam, you're no longer looking at the tip of the needle, are you? You're seeing the shaft. So you don't know where the tip of the needle is. So it requires you to move both your needle hand and your probe hand to maintain just the tip in the plane of view. And that requires some practice and good technique. So, um, and again, so both hands moving and being able to visualize just the tip uh, are the drawbacks of this approach. So I would recommend get familiar with both approaches and use one or both approaches as suits your experience and your skills and your particular patient's anatomy for each individual procedure. So again, downside of the short axis approach can be demonstrated here. We're going to leave in this example the, um, we see the tissue here and the flesh color and a, and a vessel in this blue column going horizontally in the bottom left of the screen. We have a needle entered at about a 45 degree angle through the soft tissue and the needle tip is right at the point where it's about to enter the vessel. So right now the probe being held perpendicular to this is right through the tip of the needle. So on the right hand side here on the ultrasound screen we can see the vein, we see the artery because we're looking at, again, a short axis view so we can see the lateral anatomy. We see the tip, and then typically you see some reverberation artifact coming down from it so that your, um, your needle tip winds up looking like a little comet. So the, the tip of the comet, the, the main base of it right there, is where the needle tip itself is. So now without moving the needle and without moving the patient, we're going to slide the probe back and forth just to see what the image would look like on ultrasound. So you can see here that when you're truly at the tip, you're getting an accurate picture of where the needle is. But when the probe is not at the tip and it's back towards the shaft of the needle, you'll get the sense that the needle is actually several centimeters away from the, ultra, uh, from the uh, vessel. So getting an inaccurate picture of where the tip of the needle is is a, a complication or a difficulty with using this short axis approach. And you have to be very cognizant of that. So I, the optimal use of a short axis approach takes, um, takes your probe straight through the needle tip the entire time. And one way to think about this is a, a, a pretty standard definition of the, of the uh, tip of a needle is it's the sharp part. Now, you don't have a way to tell on ultrasound how sharp something is, but you can see something or not see it. 
So I'm going to give you a different ultrasound definition of the tip of the needle in the short axis approach. The tip of the needle is the point of the needle at which you can just barely see it, and if you move the probe, you don't see it anymore. So what you're going to do is hold the probe and move the needle until the point you can see the needle, and then you move the probe away. Now you don't see the tip anymore. Insert the needle a little bit further, and now you can see the tip. Pull it away from you. You don't see it, and now you see it, and now you don't and now you see it. And this stepwise, moving the needle, moving the probe, is the way to keep the needle tip visualized through the entire process. So again, that takes a little bit of practice, just like using a long axis approach does. But here's how it looks when you do it properly. The little circle here represents the area at the tip of the needle where the beam is passing through it. And then, when the needle's high, you'll see that it's high on the ultrasound. When the needle's lower, you'll see it lower. When it's about to enter the vessel, you'll see it about to enter the vessel. So you're basically just flirting with the tip of the needle to the point where the ultrasound beam is just barely visualizing it each time. But again, having heard this, you may hate the short axis approach. And a lot of very experienced sonographers and excellent proceduralists hate the short axis approach. So let's look at the long axis approach. So you visualize the vessel find its greatest diameter, and hold rock solid your probe hand parallel right on top of the vessel. And now the vessel doesn't move and your probe hand doesn't move. The only thing that moves in a long axis approach is your right hand, your procedure hand, your, um, your uh, dominant uh, syringe hand. So you need to make sure that that needle stays uh, parallel and stays within the plane the entire time. If you see your needle starting to deviate out of the plane, you need to pull back, redirect your uh, dominant hand to put the needle back in that plane. And when that's done properly, you get the gorgeous ultrasound image that you see on the right-hand side here. With the needle going straight through the plane, you can tell exactly the trajectory, the speed at which it's approaching the vessel, and you'll be able to see all the things we talked about before. Seeing the needle tip, feeling the flash, seeing the flash of blood when you've entered the vessel. So what do you see sonographically? Again, these are short axis views when the needle is about to get into the vessel. So you're going to see some tenting at first. And on the left-hand side here, we see an example of the anterior aspect, the superficial aspect of the vein tenting down. Even though that needle is really sharp, the uh, vein is so dynamic and distensible and stretchy that you can really press it down. So when you start to see this image on the left, give the needle a quick jab forwards. And you may have been trained, like I did, that you wouldn't place a needle in the central venous system really, really slowly because you can just puncture through the vein like that old magician trick of sticking a needle through a balloon without popping it. So instead, I was taught to give it you know, straight movements. You want to move along the path of the needle and don't go side to side, but straight in in little quick jabs so you can just pop through the, the vessel wall when you encounter it. And that seemed a little strange to me at first, uh, but when I started using ultrasound and I could visualize this tenting, it made a lot more sense to me. Because if you go really slowly, you can compress the vein right down onto itself so that the anterior and posterior walls of the vessel are touching each other. And then often behind it, as in this image on the left, you'll see the uh, artery. So sometimes the only time that you'll pop through the entire vein is when you've popped through the anterior wall, the posterior wall, into the artery. And we certainly want to avoid that. So as soon as you see tenting on ultrasound, give it a quick jab and you avoid that. On the right-hand side, we can see the needle as it uh, is in the vessel. And there's the tip of the needle, bright white. Uh, needle itself right there in the little circle part and then we see some reverberation artifact ring down coming from behind it distally. So that's the, again the typical appearance that uh, a metal object like a, a needle or a wire is going to have on ultrasound. So let's take a look at positioning. I mentioned earlier that uh, the patient positioning is not only going to make a big difference, but it may vary from patient A to patient B. So here's a patient laying down flat, and we can see their sternocleidomastoid muscle just deep to the skin and soft tissue up here, and we see their internal jugular vein, and where's their IJ? So we put them into a little bit of Trendelenburg and a bit more and a bit more, and all of a sudden their IJ is plain as day, a nice big target for us to hit with the needle. So Valsalva can accomplish this. Sometimes turning the head can change the uh, appearance of the IJ very dramatically. Uh, sometimes moving your probe a little more anterior or a little more lateral on the patient's neck um, makes a big difference, and certainly Trendelenburg is always helpful. So again, all these little tips and tricks that you've learned through the course of all your prior patients, you can now bring to bear very specifically to the specific anatomy of your patient. Um, Ultrasound guidance has been described in uh, the uh, 
subclavian vein cannulation as well. It's a little bit trickier because as we see demonstrated here, the part of the uh, subclavian vessel that you would like to cannulate lies beneath the clavicle. So the clavicle can cause some shadowing and get in the way of, um, of cannulating the um, subclavian vein. So some authors have described using a longitudinal approach with the probe held above the clavicle. Some people have described a longitudinal approach with a probe held below the clavicle. Um, some people have described using an approach that's much more lateral than you normally would go. So maybe out here where you can see the vessels, uh, keeping in mind that the vessel are actually much deeper to the skin uh, than they are more medially. So here, for example, we see from lateral to medial a sweep. So starting lateral and moving medial, we see the vein here on the left, the artery on the right, and as we move from lateral to medial, we see the clavicle um, beginning to obscure the image of the IJ. I'm sorry, of the uh, subclavian vein. So again, um, there's a lot of different techniques that have been described. There's not as blatantly positive. Um, uh, every article demonstrates uh, how good this works, just like there is with the IJ. Um, so what some people recommend and what I recommend is um, uh, having a look at the subclavian uh, vein with ultrasound, determining if uh, ultrasound is going to help out with subclavian vein cannulation. And if it is, certainly use it, whether it's in a short axis or a long axis approach. And if it's not going to help you, either consider a landmark guided subclavian vein if that's the one you need to do, or consider cannulating a different vessel. Uh, certainly, um, femoral vessels can be cannulated using um, ultrasound as well. And uh, remember the high complication rate with uh, landmark assisted uh, femoral vein cannulation. So we see the typical sort of navel, the um, nerve out lateral uh, artery, and then vein being the most medial in the femoral triangle here. And uh, we can see an example of what this looks like around the level where you'd want to cannulate the common femoral vein. We can see the artery, the vein, and then the takeoff of the saphenous vein coming off here as well. Keep in mind that when you cannulate the femoral vein, you really need to be very close to the inguinal ligament. Um, some people, uh, rightly concerned about uh, causing a complication of a retroperitoneal hematoma, um, give, give the inguinal ligament a wide berth. And the difficulty is there, when you're close to the inguinal ligament, you see anatomy like you see here on the screen. And there's a nice big uh, femoral vein, and it's got a very good anatomic relationship with the artery. And the further away from the inguinal vein, uh, ligament that you get, the more distal that you get, even just by a couple of centimeters, the artery bifurcates, the vein bifurcates, and instead of being two structures that are next to each other, they become four structures that start square dancing around each other. And if you start looking at patient's anatomy, uh, patient after patient, you'll see a great variability in the location of the arteries and veins, even just an inch uh, distal to the inguinal crease. So it might make you rethink the confidence that you have in placing these code lines or in placing a non-ultrasound guided femoral line. Just because interns have traditionally used that line doesn't mean it's an easier or better line. There are still a lot of complications in using a femoral vein. So ultrasound can help out. So here's uh, an example of the ultrasound screen when we're back at the IJ now, and we see that uh, as the needle comes into view, uh, we followed it down to the IJ. There it is at the anterior aspect of the IJ starting to tent in the skin, uh, starting to tent in the anterior wall of the vessel. Give it a quick jab, and now we are within the vessel. So you can also demonstrate the guide wire. Here we're using a longitudinal view, and the guide wire here demonstrated as a bright white, very echogenic uh, structure within the vein. And ideally, you want to be able to make sure that you can see the J of the guide wire, because you want to make sure that the entire guide wire is in the vein, not just that the guide wire is passing through the vein on the way to the artery. And this reverberation or this ring down artifact that we see um, is uh, due to the physics of ultrasound energy encountering um, metal. Uh, the metal will reflect um, multiple iterations of the um, ultrasound energy back, just like um, hitting a bell will cause it to ring, as opposed to hitting a block of wood that doesn't cause it to resonate. So there's another way that you can check, uh, aside from looking at the uh, needle going into the vein, which is very helpful, uh, watching the, um, the catheter or the uh, wire go into the vein, which is also very helpful. You can also look at the heart itself and demonstrate that your uh, catheter is in the central venous system. So one technique that has been described is called the bubble test. And what you do is you take a 
some three to five cc syringe of normal saline and you inject it rapidly through the brown port in the central venous catheter or whichever catheter you've got uh, inject, uh, in the um, uh, IJ. Uh, this works in the subclavian as well. Obviously, it won't work in the femoral because it's too far away from the heart. So inject the saline rapidly. You don't need to inject air. You don't need to shake it around. Just the speed of, of a rapid injection is going to demonstrate some agitated saline, uh, and you've either got microbubbles or just agitated saline here causing turbulence. And you can see in this sub-xiphoid four-chamber um, four view of the heart, the right ventricle here and the right atrium there. And just after the injection now, we can see all this agitated saline going through the right heart, which means that uh, we've successfully cannulated the central venous system and not the arterial system. So briefly, speak about peripheral uh, IVs. And you can use a lot of the same techniques that we've uh, discussed for central venous access. We have a lot of patients that need access, they don't necessarily need central access. So placing a central line in a patient uh, just because they need IV access, uh, we might be able to give them a good peripheral line and serve them better. Fewer complications for the provider and for the patient. Certainly greater comfort, uh, maybe a less infection risk. So lots of patients fit into this category, patients who are coagulopathic, uh, patients who have um, IV drug use history and they've, uh, they've used up all their, their veins, or um, sometimes we need to leave central venous catheter sites intact for a patient who's about to undergo uh, hemodialysis, vascular surgery, uh, chemotherapy, or some other reason. So uh, here's a great uh, teamwork approach. Take a person who's really good at ultrasound in your department, like you, and take a person in your department who's really good at placing IVs, like one of your nurses, and put your skills together. So the nurse places the IV, you hold the probe, demonstrate the location of the vessel, and, and uh, let the nurse use all his or her finesse and experience placing IVs towards uh, finding that uh, IV. So this setup is great. It demonstrates um, uh, fewer uh, puncture attempts, just like you know, many articles have shown in adult and pediatric populations. So hopefully a patient that's going to be more comfortable, uh, nurses and doctors working together um, for the common goal of patient comfort and good patient care. The only thing I don't love about this picture is um, the operators both have the ultrasound machine in a place that's not really convenient where they can see it easily, so they have to turn their necks around to, to see it. So there's a couple of named veins in the arm. Those are good go-to veins when you, when you need it, but uh, any vein in the antecubital fossa is fair game. The intern vein in the forearm is fine. I've used ultrasound to place lines in the, in the, the dorsum of the hand as well. Uh, basically, you can use ultrasound to place anywhere there's a good line, uh, the, or anywhere there's a good vein is a good place to put a line. So um, if you can't find anything else, looking in all your standard locations, go to the brachial fossa, and there you will find the brachial artery, the superficial and deep brachial veins. Ideally, you'll be able to find the basilic vein as well. The basilic vein is preferred because it tends to be larger uh, than the brachial veins. It tends to be more superficial, and it doesn't have nerves and arteries surrounding it like the brachial veins do. So uh, here, for example, um, uh, image... Uh, Vessel number one is the uh, brachial artery. Numbers two and three are the superficial and deep brachial veins, respectively. And number four, all by itself, just waiting to get cannulated, is the basilic vein. So maybe the best choice in this particular case. So how can you tell the arteries from the veins? With compression. Put a bit of pressure on the artery, and it'll start to pulsate as the, basilic artery, as the brachial artery does here, BA, in this picture. And to the left and the right of it, we've got the superficial and deep brachial veins. So they're going to collapse. So again, a little bit of pressure, veins will collapse. A little bit more pressure, the artery is going to start to pulsate. So this way you can identify the arteries and the veins. It also helps to uh, highlight two aspects to this, two, uh, two corollaries to this. If you're putting too much pressure when you hold the probe, and a lot of people hold the probe with the same amount of pressure to look for veins as they would to do like a sub cardiac view. That requires a bit of probe pressure sometimes, looking at the heart. And if you put that same amount of pressure to look for veins, they're all going to be collapsed. You won't see them, especially the very fragile and uh, collapsible uh, peripheral veins. So just a little bit of pressure, just enough to make contact with the skin, and you should see the veins nicely. So don't put too much pressure. If you can't see any veins, put too much pressure. So do the opposite of what I just said. Deliberately put too much pressure. And look, instead of looking for veins, look for pulsations. And when you start to see pulsations, you can hone in on those. Once you see a pulsating artery, 
pull back the pressure to the minimal possible amount that you still have contact with the skin. And typically, right next to almost any artery in the body, there's going to be a vein. So the vein will open up after you've used the pulsatility of the artery to find it to begin with. So too much pressure prevents you from seeing a vein, and too much pressure can help you find a vein, depending on how you look at it. So how's your setup? Um, it's very similar to the setup for uh, central venous access. Make sure that you're, um, you have the patient laying down in a comfortable position. A lot of times we're going into the upper arm, so have the patient scoot all the way to one side of the bed so that their arm can be extended on the other side of the bed next to them comfortably. If someone has to sit in a weird position with their arm up over their head or tilted at a strange angle, it's hard enough to hold that position in general, let alone when you've got a patient who's just sticking a needle into their arm. So make sure the patient's as comfortable as possible and you can see your needle, you can see the patient and you can see the ultrasound machine behind them. Use a tourniquet just like you normally would. Do everything else just like you normally would with a peripheral IV, meaning you need to keep, still keep with a low angle, a lot of finesse. You can't make big jabbing motions. You can't get away with most peripheral veins with popping through the back wall and pulling back again. You have to treat peripheral veins with a bit of, uh, of gentleness just like you normally would peripheral veins. You also need to use the needle that's the right size. So your angia catheter is going to need to be longer if your vein is deeper. So whatever company sells your regular IVs also sells longer ones. So if you're using ultrasound for intravenous access frequently, you're going to find that you need to use veins that are more than half a centimeter deep. You're going to need to use a longer catheter to cannulate that. So um, here, my uh, colleague and sonographer, emergency physician Dave Riley's demonstrating technique. He's actually using a long axis approach and uh, cannulating an upper extremity vein in this uh, in this patient. I believe he's doing the basilic vein, and we can see here it's a, it's a it's a bit all bright, but there is the vein horizontally running through the course of your screen, and here we see the bevel of the needle just entering the vessel. So this is really a gorgeous image here of the needle entering the vessel. At this point, he would then thread the catheter over the needle. And there is an image of the catheter sitting inside that vessel in a patient that otherwise didn't have peripheral venous access, saving this patient from needing a central line. And it also brings up a very important thing. It seems like nurses learn this in nursing school and doctors do not learn this in doctor school. You can't just get to a vessel if you want to cannulate it. You need to have enough catheter actually sitting in the vein uh, for it to be stable. So I think this comes from us cannulating central veins where if a millimeter worth of the bevel is inside the vein and you can get a J wire into there, all of a sudden you've got a good central line. That stuff does not work with a peripheral IV. If you get a peripheral IV and it just barely taps into the vein, as soon as the patient sneezes it pops out and you've blown your vessel. So the two-thirds rule basically says you need to have two-thirds of the catheter inside the vessel for it to be a stable, usable catheter. So here, uh, from Dave Riley's example, we see that uh, a third of the length of the catheter got you down to the vessel, and two-thirds of the length of the catheter remain inside the vessel. So that's a vessel that's going to survive the night. So uh, a couple of pitfalls with this approach are things to keep in mind. A lot of times we're going to be doing this in patients who have difficult venous access. There are plenty of studies that demonstrate an over 90% success rate in placing peripheral IVs with a doc using ultrasound. And these are in patients, typically most of these studies, where the patient had several failed attempts by experienced nurses. So a nurse can't get a line at all, and all of a sudden you use ultrasound and you've got a 90% chance of getting that line. That really flips the odds in your favor. Difficult veins are still difficult veins. So ultrasound can help you find a vein, but it can't help a vein stop it from rolling. It's not going to stop um, a, uh, uh, a vein from collapsing when you go through the back wall and pull back through it again. And, um, and it's not going to help you put a 16-gauge needle into a one-millimeter wide vessel. So still, uh, you need to use the same amount of finesse that you would with a peripheral IV. So you normally put peripheral IVs in at a very shallow angle. You're not, just because you have ultrasound, going to get Get away with putting a needle into a vein at 90 degrees and expecting that catheter is going to make that turn. So use a lot of finesse. Uh, ask your nurses for help. Use very little pressure. Even the tiniest amount of pressure will uh, collapse the veins and make them very difficult to see. Deeper veins need longer catheters. And um, again, use compressibility. You don't need Doppler to uh, tell the difference between the arteries and the veins just to avoid arterial cannulation. So 
Um, thanks for your time. Lots of extra tips and tricks, videos, tutorials, and uh, news at sinaiem.us. Please visit our site, uh, email us, contact us with any tips uh, and, uh, and thoughts, and thank you.